that Terry Edom, I think, is one of the better prospects at 155. And this is the reason I say this. Uh, don't forget, this guy is now, and he's you know he's in his early 20s. He is now three and two in the UFC. Uh, he's got an interesting build. I forget who said it earlier um, that you know he's got that kind of that Tommy Hearns build where you know he's just he's freakishly tall and long for the weight. The other thing is he's already been in there with some high level guys. Uh, he went the distance with uh, Gleason Tabau and also uh, Rich Clemente. So he's he's kind of on the cusp, and you know he got a bad break here having to go against a guy. Uh, like Brian Cobb, but again, he showed a lot of versatility, and if you want to stand with Terry Edom, you're probably going to get your head kicked into the upper deck. I was at UFC 84 when he, fight Rich Clem- when he fought Rich Clemente. It was the first time I ever got to see him live, and I was so impressed with him. I mean, you heard about his background, his great striking, great leg kicks, all that stuff, but he came out guns blazing in that fight, and, and maybe you know, he overexerted himself in the, in the beginning portion of it, but I was very impressive. Uh, I've been impressed with him despite getting the loss. And, uh, you know, since then, he's been doing great. The second second win in a row, Sam Stout, no slouch. I mean, he's not exactly as good as we all thought he would be. And uh, today, Brian Cobb, uh, a, a UFC newcomer. So, you know, it's it's always tough when you have a guy who's fought, like, you know, something like five times against a newcomer. And I'm sure he was nervous, late replacement and all that. But yep. Adam is definitely a force at 155. Those kicks look devastating. And any time a guy could, you know, pinpoint his kicks like that, especially when you're kind of chopping down that tree, uh, he's definitely a force. So hopefully he can kind of, you know, round out the game and uh, slowly but surely he can move up because he was stuck there for a second being, you know, in that 10th, 9th, 11th spot. And now he seems to be finally climbing that ladder. So it's cool to see. Paul Kelly, a nice story as well. As I mentioned, uh, last time out against Marcus Davis, got easily submitted after trying to stand with him, but wasn't as aggressive as he wanted to be. He said in the pre-fight and interviews that we did with him that uh, you know he was throwing um, you know, caution to the wind. The hell with it. He was going to go in there and bang, and Troy Mond- uh, Mandalones was going to do the same thing. Now, Mandalones, I think, ran out of gas a little bit, uh, but Paul Kelly was nasty in this fight. He showed pretty good combinations. I know uh, everyone out there in the States didn't get to see the fight, but uh, Kelly mixed his punches up well, threw some great body shots, threw a crushing body shot uh, left early or kind of the middle of the first round that changed the tone of the fight and then really ground and pounded Troy Mandalones. And the tough part on this one, and you know, I had said it during the week that I thought it was a fight of the night candidate and it should be on the main card in the U.S. Folks did not get to see it. Um, boy, that bonus would have been nice because if uh, there's some pictures out there of Troy Mandalones, um, he deserved a little extra money. Well, you know, it, back to my earlier point, about you know the guys that you train with and the guys who you've been in the ring with and been in wars. Mandalonis, uh, despite the fact that he's you know kind of BFF with uh, BJ Penn, he hasn't been around this game for a very long time. The guy's only three and two after this fight. Yeah. Uh, Paul Kelly, you know nine nine fights under his belt, but he does train with you know Rampage and Wolf Slayer, and that's developing into a into a, a pretty solid uh, gym uh, or camp out of, over in the UK, and and was involved in that tough fight against Marcus Davis, I thought that it would have been a surprise if he would have lost to Mandalonis. Newcomer Mandalonis was coming off of an injury as well, so this was a fight that he needed to win and should have won and, and eventually obviously did. So a good night for the Brits. We'll talk about uh, Neil Grove in just a few minutes. Not so good for him, but uh, hey, yeah. three, three out of four ain't bad. Ariel Hawani's with us. All right, Ariel, sit tight. Uh, I had a chance to uh, grab Dan Hardy uh, just after the fight. His win, thunderous knockout, big left against Rory Markham. Great finish. And we started off the conversation. I was asking Dan Hardy about uh, just his mood going in, uh, the, that he was feeling pretty comfortable. In, in training, and uh, I knew I was, I was ready. I just needed to go in there and, you know, kind of put the pieces together and, and, and perform. I, I had all the tools to beat him. I knew, I knew that, um, and I was fit, and I was ready, and I was, I was determined. Um, but, you know, it, there's always a little, little bit of nerves because, you know, MMA is such an unpredictable sport, and, Crazy things can always happen, but I was I was very confident I was going to win. I had a perfect training camp, and and I I just I, I you know I thought the fight was going to go exactly how I, I planned. So describe what a perfect training camp is, as opposed to uh, maybe in the past when your training camp you came out of it and you're like hey, I don't feel that great. Um, well, I just I just think I mean I've got a great team behind me, um, and everyone was there to support me in this camp, and I didn't miss a single training session, and you know all the training sessions I benefited in some way from. Um, no injuries, uh, you know, just really just, just perfect. I mean, I know it's, it's, di- it's difficult to kind of describe that, but, uh, you know, just literally everything, every training session was a benefit to me. All my team and my, my training partners were there for me and everything was just kind of came together nicely. And, and, and my diet was, was, was spotless as well for, you know, 
the, the whole training camp. We heard about the diet. We talked about that about a couple of weeks ago when we uh, did an interview with you. So the diet didn't – there was no negatives to uh, eating whatever you were eating, mud and everything else? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, you know, I felt great. I've n- I really have never felt – my body feels clean, and it feels like it's functioning a lot better. So uh, yeah. it's certainly a diet that I will be uh, – I'll, I'll be sticking with. All right, so how much of the Markham trash talk actually did spur you on? Or is that, you know, in the end, does it turn out to be kind of nonsense? Because I know you definitely commented it, on it after the fight, but uh, did it get you that extra level of fired up? Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I think, uh, I mean, I, I, I think he was trying to convince himself more than anything that I didn't have that punching power to match him. Um, but, you know, I mean, this, this was my, my first my first chance to show the, the, you know, the American audience what I was about. And, um, you know, with Markham being, you know, such a such a power puncher, um, you know, I was always going to be kind of over- overshadowed by, you know, by his record and by all of his highlight reel knockouts, you know, particularly the one that he was coming off over Brody Farber. So, um, you know, to, to be able to go out there and, and you know, prove to him that, you know, that I've got that punching power, I can stop somebody with one shot, you know, fr- from any any limb. So, you know, yeah, it was, it was just it was just really satisfying just to kind of for, for all that to come together and me to prove that, you know, I do have the, the power to back up the, <laughs> the talk. That's Dan Hardy with us on the Jewelers of Las Vegas post-fight show right here on ESPN Radio 1100, streamed up on Yahoo Sports. Big winner on the night against Rory Markham. All right, take us through the knockout. It looked kind of simple. You know, I can't do it. Everyone listening can't do it, but it looked like uh, basically a left counter against a right that was a little low, kind of uh, sloppy that Markham laid out there, and you just blasted him on the temple. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was just It just landed cleanly. It just landed cleanly. I mean, um, I threw the right hand it, with the intention of knocking him out with that, and and as it came back, the left hook just followed cleanly. It's a combination that I use quite a lot, um, and it you know he committed to the punch and it just landed right on the side of his temple perfectly. And then clearly, because yeah, his head slammed to the mat, you got him with I think one more right on the jaw. I mean, there's no way in hell he's going to go on from there. And then it looked like when he got up, I don't know if you could because you were celebrating. I don't know if you saw how groggy he was, but he looked like uh, basically like even 90 seconds after the fight, he's still out of it. Yeah, I didn't really get a chance to see him. I shook his hand in, you know, in the octagon afterwards, and you know, and I thanked him and, and that. But it, it, instantly after the fight, I was just so I was just so relieved and and so happy to you know to have, have put together such a performance, you know, in front of my home crowd, and and you know for, for the American fans that uh, yeah, I, I just kind of <laughs> I just kind of got a bit excited and. Uh, I really didn't didn't pay attention to to him after the fight too much. Now I saw Dana White on his uh, video blog, and I'm guessing you were in the room there as he was doing a little uh, pre-fight speech, and he basically said, "Screw everyone on the internet who's ripping this card." How much of that did you hear? Because I, I heard you know a lot of people say, "Why is Dan Hardy the lead-in fight to the main event?" And I one of the videos I did, I said, "You know what? Watch the style of this fight. Uh, it's going to be a good fight. This if there's a lot of grappling matches, this will be the one going into the main event that will turn out to be a complete slugfest." So, how much of that did you hear? People complaining, "Oh, Dan Hardy is a lead-in fight on a UFC card. What the hell?" Yeah, I, I, I spend a lot of time on on the internet and you know on the forums and things like that, and just you know, like, I like to know what people are saying about the card. Um, you know, I'm not the kind of fighter that likes to shut themselves away. I like to be in touch with, with uh, you know, with the MMA community and, and kind of see what the vibe is around the card. And, you know, I mean, there were a lot of comments made about the fact that I was co-main event and, you know, it was only my second fight in the UFC and things like that. But at the end of the day, you know, myself and Mark, and we're, you know, we're both, you know, promising prospects. Um, we're both, you know, right at, right at the, uh, at, you know, at the beginning of our career in the UFC. And, and it was, we're both prepared to move on to bigger things and, you know, a lot of the time they're the, they're the fights that, that are more exciting for the fans because, um, you know, they're not we're not two established guys that have you know we've, we've kind of made our name, and we're not you know we don't fight protectively. We go out there to, to perform and to you know to put on the show, um, and I, you know I think we proved that tonight. You know, I'm, I'm, it's unfortunate that Markham didn't get to show a little more of his game because he's a fantastic fighter. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I went out there and, and we fought and I got a, and it's just nice to be able to deliver. What did you think of the music that Markham used on the way in? Did you hear it? Yeah, it was good. It, it was really good. It was, you, know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think it went down well with the fans. Unfortunately, you know, because he was fighting me, he didn't get the, the, the you know the support that he deserved. But right, um, yeah, it, it was great music. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of Black Five. So. All right, I don't know. It sounded like a funeral march or taps. I was like, uh, bro, you're a little suggestive there with the music. You better be careful. <laughs> it, it does stir. It does stir a little emotion in the soul, though. Here yeah. in Black Five, I don't know whether that's just with me being British or what, but. Maybe it was down to the film Braveheart. 